All right. Thank you, Jim. Um, so my group has been involved in developing uh, analysis tools for, for nanopore data for about the last two and a half years now, primarily through a, a close collaboration I've had with Nick Lohman's group. Uh, and we've taken the view that to get the most out of nanopore data, we really want to work with the raw signal as much as possible. Uh, so we've been developing these tools to, to build probabilistic models of nanopore data and then do things like computing uh, accurate genome assemblies. Uh, so my talk's going to have three parts here. I'm going to first give an introduction to what signal level nanopore data is and uh, how we view it. Uh, then I'm going to walk you through how we compute a consensus sequence, an improved sequence for genome assembly, uh, to really illustrate the core principles that go into our software. Uh, and then finally, I'll give a more broad overview uh, of this toolkit we've been developing, which is called Nanopolish, uh, and some of the applications uh, that we support. Okay. Um, so here's an illustration of uh, how we see nanopore sequencing work. Um, so in blue here, we have a protein nanopore, which is just a protein with a channel running through the center of it. Uh, that channel is uh, large enough such that single-stranded DNA can pass from one side of a membrane to the other. Uh, as that single-stranded DNA is passing through the membrane, uh, through the nanopore, um, it's going to partially disrupt the flow of electrical current through the pore. Now, the mid-ion sequencer is continuously monitoring the amount of current that's flowing uh, at around 4 kilohertz um, and writing those current samples out to FAST5 files, uh, which is the observable data of the, of the system. Um, now, the fundamental principle here is that the sequence context, and by that I mean the DNA sequence that's uh, within the pore, is going to disrupt this flow of electrical current in some way. It's going to disrupt it in a way that's measurable and a way that we can uh, use to infer what the DNA sequence was that passed through the pore. So here's an illustration of the data generation process. At some uh, time, we have a state of the system that the nanopore is sampling current measurements from. So we're going to make a sample here. Let's say it's around 60 picoamps. It's going to make another sample. This is a little bit lower, maybe 59 and a half. And it's going to continually sampling from the current state of the system. Uh, now, at some time, there's uh, a movement of DNA where it gets pushed through the pore by a single base. This introduces a new sequence context into the pore, which changes the properties of these signals that we're going to measure. So if we make uh, another sample or a group of samples, we see that the, the current has dropped down to maybe 50 picoamps. And then as DNA moves and we continually, continuously sample current, we hope to see these movements up and down of current that reflect these uh, movements of DNA through the pore. So let's move to the end. We now sequence this entire single strand of DNA, and we have this observed current uh, that was based on that DNA sequence. Now, when we talk about doing signal-level algorithms for nanopore data, I mean that working with these raw current samples. And there's typically two levels of uh, analysis at the signal level that we do. So there's what we call the raw samples, which are these uh, current measurements taken at around 4 kilohertz. But there's also segmented current that we call events. So an, a segmentation algorithm, like the one that runs in the albacore base collar, takes these current samples and then tries to look for change points in, in the sample where the current has substantially uh, um, uh, changed. So why we work with events is that uh, they typically are, are much uh, smaller. You have many fewer events after you segment uh, the current in, into these values. Um, so our algorithms typically run faster, and there's not a lot of information lost of going from the raw current samples down to events. Um, so each event has a, a tuple of data describing the event, which is the mean current level, so the average current across the samples in that event, the standard deviation, and the duration of the event, which is thus num the number uh, of samples that went into it. So over the next two days, you'll probably hear about both event level analysis and also raw sample level analysis, um, which are both working with the current data just in, in diff two different forms. So you probably also hear quite a lot about base calling over the next few days. 
Um, so base calling is really a primary analysis task for nanopore data, and this is just uh, the process of going from these current measurements into a DNA sequence. You want to infer what the DNA sequence was that passed through the pore that gave rise to these current measurements. Um, so the, the dominant way of doing base calling now is using recurrent neural networks. For a while, is using hidden Markov models and. Uh, no matter what your probabilistic framework for, uh, for, for performing the base calling, they basically work the same where they take this vector of events with these uh, mean, standard deviation, and duration, put it through your probabilistic model, say your neural network, and that applies a label to each one of the events, which is the short subsequence that we think of as being in the poor when those current measurements were taken. So in this case, it's labeled the third event of this sequence, um, with the KMER GCTAC. Now this process is repeated, it is applied to all events in the sequence, and you get um, a, now a labeled version of the events that have overlapping labels. And if you then merge the overlapping labels together, you get your final base called sequence out at the end. So, as I mentioned, we've been interested in signal level analysis. Um, so we're trying to push the limits of how accurate nanopore sequencing can be. This is the main focus of uh, my group's work. So we don't want to have any loss of information of going from these events into base calls. So we're trying to work at the level of the raw measurements as much as possible to retain all of the information and not have any of the ambiguity that you get when you convert uh, from events to, say, fibers. Uh, the drawback of this is that the file sizes we deal with are quite large. Uh, fast five files can be many terabytes in size collectively for large sequencing projects, whereas base call data tends to be much, much smaller. Uh, and the algorithms that we work with tend to be uh, slower as they're using these probabilistic models, like hidden Markov models, recurrent neural networks, uh, to process this, this large vector of event data. Um, nonetheless, we think there's big improvements in accuracy, as I hopefully uh, will demonstrate by taking this view of working with the raw signal data as much as possible. Uh, so Nanopolish started as um, a program to call a consensus sequence for genome assembly using these, these signal-based algorithms. Um, this was a project that Nick Lohman and I and Josh Quick um, started when we first sequenced the E. coli genome and we were able to assemble it to a single contig. Uh, but since then, we've developed new applications of these signal level ideas, um, which are variations on this theme of building probabilistic models of the, of the raw signal data. Uh, so we can now call SNPs and indels with respect to our reference genome, a fairly common uh, sequence analysis task. Uh, I've been working with Winston Timp on developing ways of uh, calling modified bases, primarily 5-methylcytosine, and more recently we're now starting to uh, look at phasing reads, so building long-range haplotypes um, by taking the signal level view of the data. So to illustrate how nanopolish works, and they're all sort of working with the same common framework, I'm going to talk about this consensus problem and how we can uh, compute an improved sequence for a genome assembly um, at the signal level. So the consensus problem is a classic problem in bioinformatics. You have a group of overlapping reads for some region of uh, a genome. These reads have sequencing errors, and you want to calculate the true sequence of the genome while accounting for these sequencing errors. Now, if the error rate of sequencing is quite low and randomly distributed, um, standard algorithms work quite well, like computing a multiple sequence alignment between all of your reads for this region of the genome, and then just taking the most frequent base at a, every column of the multiple sequence alignment. Um, for nanopore data, um, there isn't sort of an analog of this algorithm at the, at the level of the signals. So here's a depiction of the event trace for three different reads. And it's not really clear how we're going to compute the consensus sequence from those uh, three different traces. So the way that we do it is we want to compute the consensus sequence that is closest in some sense to all of our observed event data. When I say closest, I mean that we want to score them using some probabilistic model that maximizes the probability of observing uh, these events. So Nanopolish, for the last two and a half years, uses a hidden Markov model to do this. It has uh, a state for every KMER of your cons uh, candidate consensus sequence. And state-to-state -state transitions through the HMM model these movements of DNA through the pore. 
Um, the measurement process of actually sampling currents are modeled using a uh, set of Gaussian distributions where the parameters of the distribution uh, are determined by the actual k-mer sequence. And using this model and, and standard HMM algorithms like the forward algorithm, we can calculate the probability of observing an arbitrary nanopore read from an arbitrary consensus sequence. And this gives us this scoring function that we can then use to optimize our genome assembly. So here's what it looks like. The input into the model is a set of event space reads. So these are encoded in the FAST5 files and these event tables that I mentioned are quite large. Um, and also a set of possible consensus sequences. So this is essentially an optimization problem where we start with an initial draft genome assembly. We put, uh, we apply mutations to it, so random substitutions, random insertions and deletions, we score them with this hidden Markov model. If it increases the probability of observing the input reads, we take those, uh, those modifications, apply them into our genome, and then we iterate this process, making another round of, of mutations until it converges on a sequence that we can no longer improve. So we've had this algorithm for about two years now, and the very first assembly that we performed was uh, E. coli using uh, version five of the sequencing kits, uh, our seven data, and we got a genome assembly of about 99.5% accuracy uh, when compared to the reference genome. Through various improvements to uh, mostly the underlying data, but also a little bit on, of our model, uh, we've been able to get that up to a 99.95, which I think is, is um, the most accurate nanopore-only assembly uh, for a genome to date. Uh, we've also been applying this method in more challenging uh, situations. So I was involved with a, a large consortium of, of great people from around the world to sequence a human genome. We already heard a little bit about that from Karen's talk earlier, um, and the preprint the title of it's at the bottom of this slide. Um, and we wanted to see how well we could uh, calculate a consensus sequence for a human genome, um, and we used chromosome 20 as a test case. Uh, so the initial assembly from CANU was about 95.5% identity. When we used nanopolish to improve that consensus, we went up to 99.2. When we used the latest base called reads, um, they really helped the CANU assembly, um, and the CANU consensus was 97.8% identity, then applying nanopolish to it and brought it up to 99.4. Um, if we then layer a little bit of Illumina data on top to help in difficult sequencing contexts like homopolymer runs, uh, we got that up to 99.96. Uh, again, more details are in the paper with uh, the link at the bottom, or the title at the bottom, and also Sergey's talk uh, in the breakout at 4 p.m. today uh, we'll also discuss this project. So consensus calling was the first application of nanopolish. This was the, this was the f what we were initially uh, designing the software for. But this idea of looking at the events and calculating probabilities uh, from our model also applies in different uh, situations. Uh, so Nick Lohman and Josh Quick uh, quite famously took the nanopore sequencers to West Africa to perform uh, real-time surveillance of the Ebola outbreak, and I was uh, quite happy to contribute to this project by building nanopolish into a reference-based SNP collar that we could use to find uh, mutations. And as I mentioned, I've been working with Winston Timp to detect base modifications and also read phasing. So I'm going to talk about these three different applications just at a very high level uh, for the remainder of my talk. So the process of calling SNPs is quite similar to calling a consensus sequence. Here, instead of applying random mutations to a genome and then assessing whether they improve the probability of observing the data, we're going to sample possible variants from the reads aligned to a reference genome and then uh, calculate whether those, uh, those sampled variants improve our probabilities. Uh, quite a new feature in nanopolish and something we needed to develop for our human genome sequencing project is the ability to call SNPs and indels uh, in diploid genomes and, and even polyploid genomes if we start to think about some of the plants that we heard about in the last talk. Um, so the idea is quite similar to what I've already presented in that we're trying to look for mutations or modification to a sequence and increase probability of this data, but rather than trying to optimize a single sequence, like in the case of computing a consensus for a bacterial genome, now we want to consider pairs or sets of sequences to see if we can improve those probabilities. 
So for a human genome, we might have um, uh, three pairs of sequences, one where it's homozygous reference, one where it's heterozygous, one where it's homozygous alternative sequence. We then put those pairs into our hidden Markov model, calculate these probabilities, and output at the end a genotype call. Um, so we tested this by genotyping 1,000 genomes, uh, non-singleton SNPs in our human genome uh, paper at 30x coverage. Our genotype accuracy was quite good, it was 99.2, but this can be a little bit misleading because it's quite easy to genotype a very large set of SNPs where you expect most of them to be homozygous reference, like when you're uh, applying the 1,000 genomes. So if we look at a more difficult case where calculating the genotype at sites that are known to be variable in NA12878, which is the cell line we uh, used for this experiment, we have an accuracy of about 95%, with the, the main source of error being missing called uh, heterozygous sites. So we want to go one step further and not only calculate genotypes, but also phase them into haplotypes. We want to use as much of the long read information as possible, so the natural thing to do is try to phase the reads uh, back into parental chromosomes. So I've written a tool to uh, support this application. There's a few other use cases that are interesting. The general idea is that we want to take every read that we've observed, every long read, find all of the heterozygous sites that are covered by that long read, and then calculate which alleles at the hets are supported by that individual read. So I call this read-based phasing because we're calculating little sub-haplotypes that are covered by each read, and then they can be assembled together into longer range uh, phases using programs like WhatsApp. So the way this works is we take a read, shown in here, we find all the heterozygous sites, we're represented by these question marks here, we generate the four possible haplotypes along uh, this read, we would score them using this probabilistic model, and then select the best scoring uh, haplotype as the haplotype that that read supports. So the output of this program uh, is what we call a phased BAM file. It can be loaded into a program like IGV or used with haplotype uh, assemblers like WhatsApp. Um, crucially, we emit quality scores for each one of our base assignments that allow WhatsApp to weight the corrections that it makes when assembling uh, haplotypes by the probability that we've made an error in these assignments. Um, so we've been assessing how well we can phase using this NA12878 human genome that we sequenced. Uh, here we're not phasing the genotypes calculated by nanopolish, but we're using the uh, platinum genotypes called from Illumina data as we wanted to assess the effect of coverage. Um, once we get up around 30x coverage, we can phase into block sizes of about 100 KB with a very low switch air rate of, of, of less than 1%. And doing this um, signal level assignment of alleles to, ha uh, to reads reduces the switch error rate even more. Now, Josh Quick just talked about these ultra long reads we can now sequence. We're not using any of the extremely long reads here. So I think once we introduce them, we'll be able to assemble much, much longer haplotypes because you'll have less, fewer runs of homozygosity that uh, break your haplotype assembly process. And finally, in the last few minutes I have here, I just want to talk a little bit about methylation. I've talked about methylation uh, at a previous uh, London calling, um, and it's been a big focus of my lab uh, in collaboration with Winston for the last, say, about year and a half. So I work at Cancer Research Institute. We're interested in sequencing tumors. We want to find structural variation, but we also want to find methylation that we can use for things like subtyping. Um, so the idea here is that we want to learn a new set of Gaussian distributions that will allow us to distinguish between methylated and unmethylated versions of KMERS. So the way we, we've approached this, if we take uh, genomic DNA, we treat it with a methyl transferase, a CPG methyl transferase, we then sequence that modified DNA on the min ion, align it to a reference genome, and we can build up these profiles of current um, for the methylated and the unmethylated versions of each KMER. And the difference between these two distributions is what gives us the ability to find methylation at these particular contexts. So in the paper Winston and I published uh, last month, we only had very low coverage sequencing data for human genome. We've now been able to test it in a wider context using this 30X of NA12878 that we sequenced. 
Um, and we were able to directly compare the frequency of methylation that we call with nanopolish to uh, the gold standard of sequencing uh, base methylation, which is bisulfide followed by alumina. And we see that we're very well correlated in our methylation frequency um, across these sites on chromosome 20. Um, for more information about this, um, I'll just put in a plug for Winston's talk later on. Well, he'll, he'll go into this in much more detail. Uh, so in summary here, um, Nanopolish is a toolkit for working with, with nanopore data. At the signal level, we support consensus calling, now SNP and indel discovery and genotyping, methylation detection, and a little bit of read phasing. Um, one big direction that my lab is currently working in is uh, trying to replace the hidden Markov model that we, we base these, these calculations on with a neural network. I think Oxford Nanopore has shown quite well that uh, neural networks give uh, much higher accuracy base called, so we're hoping to translate those improvements into consensus accuracy as well and, f and hopefully uh, reduce that 0.1% error rate that we still have. Uh, Nanopolish is entirely open source um, and available on GitHub for anybody who's, hap uh, who's interested in testing it at the, at the URL here. Um, and I'll just put my acknowledgement slide up here, but also highlight uh, my funding, um, mainly Oxford Nanopore, who provide research funding to my group. And I'll thank you and happy to take questions. Jared, that was excellent as ever. Um, the obvious um, combination is to do methylation calling on haplotypes, I mean, to kind of phase yeah. the methylation calling. Is that going to be, inverted commas, trivial? Or, or is there, you know, I look at that and I think to myself, surely that's just, like, going to be easy. Or is there some problem in thinking about that? And that's quite exciting to get kind of phased, phased methylation data straight out of your sequencing. Uh, yes. Data, yeah. I, the last talk I gave at AGPT, I talked about that, and, and we can phase methylation. We have experimental code, very experimental code for, for doing that. Um, after uh, I, I sit down, I'll post a link to my slides from, from AGPT where, where we have a few results there. But yeah, that's definitely something we're very interested in. And we can see quite clearly haplotype-specific methylation, where the, the patterns of methylation phase with heterozygous SNPs. So this is definitely something that's very exciting. I, I, Sorry, I think the really, and the extra exciting thing about that is those methylation sites which aren't close to a SNP, you'll still be able to capture those quite distal yeah. methylation sites, but face them. So uh, that's going to be really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So as people start using this technology to sequence um, stranger sample types, bacteria from the ocean, ancient DNA maybe, um, I can imagine that there's going to be uh, base modifications that are a bit rarer, um, that we don't have the ability to use an experimental system like your methyl transferase yeah. um, to make expectations on the signal um, for. Uh, how would you go about detecting such rarer modifications? Do you think there's much prospectus for this? Yeah, so if you just, we have a program also within Nanopolis I didn't talk about of aligning events to a reference genome. Um, that's aligning them given your current model of the KMERS. And if you can see differences in the distribution, you might not know what the methylation uh, different, what the methylated base is, but you can see a shift in the distribution when you align to these, uh, to the reference cameras. I think the best example of a working pipeline for this is, is by Mark Estroiber, who just uh, gave a, a talk on NanoRAW, and he's got a pipeline that will automate this and actually pull out the motif that's, uh, that's methylated by, by this idea of aligning to a reference genome. Um, so a new set of applications is RNA sequencing, and there you have over a hundred modifications. And when I talk to CS people and say we want to now delve into that, they roll their eyes. But of course the modifications are not everywhere. And are the prospects of learning those over time uh, realistic? Yeah, I think we probably want to use an approach like what with the previous question was, where we align to the reference genome using our current model, which doesn't take any, any modifications look for differences, look for shifts in the, the distribution, and then try to cl classify them afterwards. Learning uh, sort of an expanded alphabet of 100 possible modifications. I'm a computer scientist. I'm definitely going to consider that to be daunting. And like, I don't want this Kamer set that's, uh, you know, 
100 to the 4. Um, so we're, I, I think we need to be more restrictive of what type of methylation marks we, we can call, and it might just be things like we can say there is a modification here, but we're, we're not sure what it is. I think we need to, what we really lack though, and something that was really nice about the 5-methylcytosine project is that we could generate this training data to build these distributions where we know what the methylation mark is. And, and building training data for these other types of methylation is, is something that like Winston and I talk about quite a bit and, and you know, really happy to chat about that. Okay, I'm gonna thank you very much and uh, Jared will certainly be around the rest of the conference and you're certainly welcome to approach him. I hope I can volunteer you for that um, yes, to answer fine. any of the questions you might have. <laughs> So with that, thank you, and thank you again for your lovely presentation. Thank you.